We've got a real treat today. Gifted communicator John Bevere is one of those authors you just can't put down, and I'm speaking from experience. In his latest book, The Awe of God, John tackles what it means to fear God and how many of us Christians may be missing uh, the mark in this specific area. Welcome back to Huntley Street, John. It is always a pleasure. Mark, I feel like you're my extended family up there. I miss you guys. I, I miss being there in person. I think the last several we've done have been by Zoom, but... Uh I hey, it's today's technology, and it saves a lot of time in the airports. It sure does, and airports aren't necessarily a fun place on the best of days. But how are you? How is the family? Um, any new grandbabies, G-babies, as you like to call them? Yes. Yes, G-babies. So the family's great. Uh, all four sons and all four daughter-in-laws, which the last time I was on, I was only able to say three daughter-in-laws are doing quite quite well three of them actually work for us two daughter-in-laws and three sons work for us and then uh the g babies oh my gosh we just got news about number seven on the way so we are lisa and i are just like oh, loving it that is wonderful my friend congratulations we just so love and appreciate your family and the feeling is mutual about you feeling like part of our family and we need to make sure the next time you're on the program it's in studio god willing um, understanding the dynamics of godly fear is a big part of what you tackle in this book. And I'm really, really glad you've decided to tackle it. And I mean, we're talking 400 some odd pages here. It, it's, it's, a, it's an extensive read um, because there seems to be such a negative stigma attached to anything associated with fear. What inspired you to write the book in this season? Well, first of all, there's 40 distinct benefits that I've found in walking in the holy fear of God. The number one benefit is an intimate relationship with God. The Bible actually says that's the starting place. You haven't even begun to enter into an intimate relationship with God until you fear him. Now, you said it right. We've tried to eradicate fears. We had the t-shirts we wore that said no fear, but I think we've done a disservice that we put all fears into one bucket, and that's destructive fears. However, I want to submit to everybody there are constructive fears and destructive fears. Let me give you an example. Fear produces wisdom. The constructive fear of not being mauled to death by a mother grizzly bear will give you the wisdom to not mess with her cubs. That fear will save my life. If you look at the holy, healthy fear of God, this fear will eradicate all, and I mean all, unhealthy fears. That is one of the benefits. So the first thing I want to say to everybody is this. The fear of the Lord has nothing to do with being afraid of God. Mm. It's all about being close to him and reverencing who he is, respecting who he is, and standing in awe of who he is that actually opens up and enhances our relationship with him. Yeah, I mean, that's a really very important distinction. And so many people get stuck on the definition of fear and what it means and getting hung up on that word, especially in Scripture and understanding context. I'm going to throw a left-field question at you right now, and this is just kind of going out okay. on a limb. Do you think that this, we'll say, fear of fear, if you will, has done an, an awful disservice to the moral fabric of society. We've got loss of respect Absolutely. for teachers, for authorities, Absolutely. for anything, for, for, yeah. for clergy. You know what I'm saying? Yes, it has. It has absolutely brought us into a place that we are falling and we're falling fast. Because if you look at the fear of the Lord, it is the key to longevity. So I'll never forget when that presence of the holy fear of God manifested in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It was so powerful, Mark. I remember being terrified because it was so awesome. Now, let me, let me, let me calm everybody. I was drawn to it. Mm -hmm. So it's really strange. You're almost terrified by how awesome his presence is. I mean, if you look at Isaiah, Isaiah was a godly man. And Isaiah had one glimpse of the Lord, and he is literally not crying out, woe is the sinners. He's crying out, woe is me, because he really realizes who he is before this awesome God. If you look at John the Apostle, he was really close to Jesus. But when he saw him on the island of Patmos, 
he fell down like a dead man. Now, of course, Jesus said, hey, don't be afraid. But his fear of God drew him closer. And I look at the holy, healthy fear of God, and it's missing. So what's happening is we're not getting to the heart of God. But over in Malaysia, what happened is when that presence manifested, it lasted about five minutes. I'll never forget, the leader came up, and he was very wise. He said, the atmosphere in here is so holy, so powerful. I'm not closing with a song like we had planned. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to stay here as long as you want. And people stayed for a long time because the presence of God was so thick. And I remember I was walking out, and there was this couple from India. They were in the Bible school, and they're just looking at me. And they said to me, we feel so clean inside. Mm -hmm. And I said, that identifies what I feel. That presence made me feel so clean. Well, the next morning I was getting ready to play basketball with the guys in Malaysia, the Bible school students, putting on my gym shorts and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, read Psalm 19. And I started reading verse one, verse two, verse three. I get to verse nine and I read this, the fear of the Lord is clean. And I went, wow, there it is. But then the next words riveted me, enduring forever. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, Mark, and said, Lucifer led worship right before my throne. He beheld my glory. He was anointed to do so. He did not fear me. He didn't endure forever. A third of the angels surrounded the throne. They beheld my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure in their place in heaven forever. He said, Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the garden in the presence of my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure in the garden forever. And he said to me, every created being that surrounds my throne throughout eternity will have experienced the holy, healthy fear of God. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about it, Mark. There's been millions of people that have walked away from the faith in the last 20 years. Barna says over 23 million Americans alone have gone from being practicing believers to now agnostics, atheists, and spiritualists. Why are people leaving the faith? Because we stop talking about the fear of the Lord. If you look at what the Apostle Paul says, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not with love and kindness, but with fear and trembling. So it's the key to maturing our salvation, and that keeps us strong so that we endure to the end. So yes, it endures forever, and yes, it matures our salvation so we're doing a disservice to men and women by not teaching the healthy aspect of the holy fear of God. Hmm, hmm. Is it safe to say that perhaps here in the West we've become a bit too familiar with God that we don't recognize the power that is accessible to us when we fear and reverence him? I believe what we've done is we have systematically taught in a way in the Western church to remove all healthy fear from a relationship with God. And I think that that disservice has caused an immature church. We've not been able to mature. We've not been able to grow in true, authentic holiness. And I, and I want to I back it up here. And I want to help everybody understand something. I said the fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. Let's think about when Moses brought Israel out to the mountain mountain, Mount Sinai. God came down on the third day after they arrived there. And when he did, the people all screamed and ran away. When they ran away, Moses makes a statement to them in Exodus 20, 20. He says, hey, do not fear because God's come to test you to see if his fear is in you so that you may not sin. Now, wait a minute. Do not fear because God's come to see if his fear is in you. He's differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The person that's scared of God has something to hide. What does Adam do when he sins against the Lord? He hides from the presence of God. The person that fears God has nothing to hide. That person's actually terrified of being away from God. So as I've already stated, our first real understanding of holy fear is to be scared of being away from God. So what holy fear is, is when we love what he loves and we hate what he hates because we reverence him to such a degree we take on his heart. So now that's why the Bible says all who fear the Lord will hate evil. I'll never forget one of the world famous evangelists who is put in prison for five years. 
looked at me. I asked him a question because he got totally delivered in prison. His life got turned back around straight. And I said, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? He said to me, I didn't. I said, wait a minute. You committed adultery. You committed mail fraud. You were sentenced. What do you mean you didn't fall out of love with Jesus? He said, John, I loved him all the way through it. And I was confused. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, John, I didn't fear God. And I look at this, Mark, the, the road to life is a narrow road, Jesus said. And every road's got two ditches on both sides. The first ditch is called legalism. Okay, so legalism. What? How did God deliver us from the legalistic ditch? Well, the love of God. Mm -hmm. Remember the church back in the 60s? We were in a legalistic ditch. The 70s, we were in a legalistic ditch. We found out God is a good God. That We found out our daddy loved us. And that genuine revelation of the love of God delivered us from legalism. We went to the other side of the road and fell into the other ditch, and that's called lawlessness which lawlessness is when I am a law unto myself and I get to pick and choose what I'm going to obey. In other words, God's word is not what directs my life. I pick what aspects I like of the word of God and the ones I don't like, I ignore. That's lawlessness. And the Bible says that is the very definition of sin. I mean, Adam didn't jump in bed with a prostitute in the garden. He disobeyed because he thought it was better for him to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when God said it's harmful for you. So that lawless behavior led to the downfall. It's lawlessness that leads to any person's downfall. And what the fear of God does is it delivers us and keeps us from entering into a lawless state. In other words, where we kind of say, God, step aside. I know it's better for my life than you do. Right, right. And 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 that's that's a really big risk as a believer to put yourself in that position. Um, you know, it Proverbs is. 9 and 10 tells us the fear of Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and you know, you're saying that there's this beautiful life and, and you unpack this beautifully in the book. And there's so many references to a holy fear of God in a context that is, it makes sense. It, it, it totally, it, it connects the dots, if you will. But you just talk about this beautiful life that's awaiting those of us that understands what it means to fear him. Yes. If you look at uh, Proverbs, I think it's 1433. It says the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the traps of death. Oh my goodness. That's remarkable when you think about it. Okay. Fountain. You know, we say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, you haven't even begun to enter into wisdom that will last forever until you fear God. But I love how it says it's a fountain of life. Now, the word fountain in the Hebrew means a continual flowing source. So here's God's promise that when we walk in the healthy fear of God, we will have a continual flow of the counsel of wisdom that will turn us away from the traps of death. And I think one of the greatest examples of this is King Abimelech. If you look at King Abimelech, and he's a guy that has no relationship with God, but he fears God. Now, everybody's probably thinking, wait a minute, how can you fear God and have no relationship with him? Well, I'll give you an example in the New Testament, Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion, but the Bible says he was devout. And his holy, and that word devout means he feared God. His fear of God ends up causing an angel to come and appear to him and say, hey, I can't tell you how to get saved. I can't tell you how to get a relationship with God. Go down to this guy's house named Simon the Tamar, Tanner in Joppa. Ask for this guy named Peter, and he'll tell you how to get saved. So there's an example of somebody who has a fear of God, a healthy fear of God, but is, has no relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at Abimelech, he is king of Gier, and Abraham and Sarah come into his country in Genesis 20. And Abraham looks at his wife and says, you know, you're far too gorgeous for me to present to you as my wife, and this is a godless nation. He perceives it as a godless nation. He says, I'm going to say you're my sister. So he, he, he brings her in. He introduces it, hit Sarah as his sister. Well, Abimelech goes, wow, this woman's gorgeous, brings her into her, his harem. Well, God comes to him in a dream and says, you are a dead man because the woman you have is another man's wife. And King Abimelech says, I'm innocent. 
Would you, would you judge me? I, he told me she was his sister. And, and listen to God's response. I know. And that's why I kept you from sinning against me and did not let you touch her. Now, the fear of the Lord was a continual flowing source of God's wisdom that kept Abimelech from the trap that Abraham put before him hmm. by lying to him or actually deceiving him and saying, she's just my sister. So let me ask this question. How can somebody attend church, hear the word of God for 20 years, and end up in bed with another man's wife? It's not rocket science. It just means he doesn't have a holy, healthy fear of God that is the continual flowing source of God's counsel of wisdom that protects him from the traps of death. Traps are baited. Traps are camouflaged. Death is always baited and camouflaged. But the fear of the Lord, this is why the Bible says, by the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 16, 8, one departs from evil. It's that continual flowing source of God's wisdom, Mark. And I want to see everybody in the body of Christ walking in this. Amen. Such life-giving teaching, John, as always. Thank you so much for opening our eyes and, and our ears to the importance of godly fear. Such a timely message. And I love the fact that you, you really, you know, you bring it home with this point that it's really the missing link. It's what will unlock this profound sense of intimacy with God. And uh, the book, once again, to our viewers is The Awe of God. John Bevere, you're the author. And we so thoroughly enjoy having you on the program. God bless you, my friend. I'm looking forward to the next time we get to chat. Always an honor. Thank you, Mark.